Well, good evening. It is good to see everyone as we come to uh, join our hearts and minds as we worship on this night, on this holy and august night. We give thanks uh, for this time. I've, I always find that uh, when we take Monday, Thursday, and even Good Friday seriously, when we get to Easter Sunday morning, it means so much more. Because we've actually walked that path. We've uh, been with our Savior. We've seen the amazing love and the outpouring of spirit. We've even seen uh, the evil and the depravity of human beings and how ultimately God wins. But You know, we also have to kind of harken back and say, you know, there was a time where we didn't know how the story ended. And as best we can, even though we know the outcome, it's good to put us in those shoes. It's good to relive, to think, and to allow God's Holy Spirit to speak into our lives and our hearts and even to teach us something new. If you can believe it, we can learn new things, even in services that we do every year. God is speaking in powerful ways. And so I pray that God speaks into your hearts and your lives on this evening. I do want to lift up that tomorrow at 7 o'clock, again, here in the sanctuary, we will have our Good Friday service. Our youth choir, New Zion, will be leading us in that, and so we look forward to that. Uh, and I also want you to note that at the end of the service, we're going to be leaving in silence. Now, why would this be important? Well, it helps us to set the stage for our hearts for our minds as we again prepare ourselves for tomorrow night and also then as we come in joy on Sunday morning. And so I want to invite you to, uh, I think sometimes we maybe talk too much and we get in the way of what the Holy Spirit is speaking into our lives. And so this is an opportunity for us to just live into the passion of Jesus Christ and to allow Christ's actions to speak anew to our lives. My friends, let's continue to prepare our hearts and minds in worship.
please stand as you're able. Call to worship. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard, heard me cry, cry for, for mercy. mercy. Because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. I will sacrifice a thank offering to him and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. And let us continue examining, experiencing the wondrous love of Christ through the hymn, page 292, an American folk hymn. Please sing. seated and join me in the prayer litany. You knew your hour had come. You knew your betrayer. You knew your enemies. You knew that the straw vote would not be in your favor, but you loved until the end. Thank you for loving us, even unto death. Teach us to love like you love. 
Teach us to love each other, to love even our enemies, like you loved us. You took on the form of a servant, washing the feet of those whom you discipled. You defined humility and servanthood. You are he who was surely sent from God. Thank you for serving for us. Teach us to be servants without fail, to make humility our constant companion, and to seek no glory for ourselves. Remind us when we forget. And now our hymn, Oh, How He Loves You and Me. And what grace we find in giving our gifts and our offerings on a night of discovering and remembering what wondrous love is this. Let us pray together our offertory prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you have shown us the way of humility and servanthood. Through your spirit, work within us, we pray that we may be servants to each other, to the community that surrounds us, and to our world. Amen. Receive now the gifts.
Amen. Friends, hear these words as I read to you from this library of books that inspire us to love and to serve. This is from the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to John. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it in of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, was going to God, God took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my head and my hands. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean, and you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so I now say to you, where I am going... You cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Friends, this is the story of God spoken for each of you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was in high school, I lived in New Braunfels, and we had a stretch of years where we had numerous floods. Some of them were pretty devastating. Fortunately, my home in New Braunfels was not in the floodplain itself, but these floods often left me stranded, alone in a house with my little brother with nowhere to go and no one to see. And for me, this wasn't really that bad of news. It meant that I could bury myself in my books for long, long stretches of time. And it was during one of those floods that I laid down on the floor in front of our big picture window at the front of our house and began to read a book that I would love forevermore. This book was recommended to me by my physics teacher. Now, this teacher had not just a reputation of being strange. This teacher was strange. But he was a brilliant and a funny kind of strange. And I loved this teacher. So when he just dropped the name of this book one day, I went immediately to my local Hastings and I ordered it and all of its sequels and I waited one or two weeks for those books to get there. Can you imagine waiting for a book for one or two weeks at this point? Fortunately, those books got there right before the storm. And I was prepared for the isolation of the next few days. So the rain came, 
And I started to read, and as I said, this book became one of my favorites. The setting was perfect in the rain, the situation was great, and it was such a fun book for a young nerd like myself. The book is called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Has anybody read this book? I hear some laughs, so I know some of you have read it. It's written by a man named Douglas Adams, and it was first published in 1979. It's a comedic science fiction novel that became a comedic science fiction series with radio programs and TV series and movies all to go along with it. The Hitchhiker's Guide, this book, is about another book, namely The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Something like a Frommer's for the Galactic Traveler. And on the cover of this giant book is written the words, Don't Panic. And within, the resourceful hitchhiker will find entries that will help them nav navigate all of the most interesting and strange and extraordinary circumstances one could find in a big galaxy. If you're looking for a fun read, I do recommend it. As you peruse The Hitchhiker's Guide, among the entries that you'll find is this description of one of the most useful artifacts in all of the galaxy. The guide says that a towel is about the most massively useful thing that you could have in the galaxy. Partly, it has great practical value. You can wrap it around you for warmth. You can lie on it on the brilliant marble sanded beaches. You can sleep beneath it under the stars that shine so redly in a desert. You can use it to sail a mini raft down a slow and heavy river. You can wet it for use in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You can wrap it around your head to ward off noxious fumes. You can wave the towel in emergencies as a distress signal. And of course, you can dry yourself off with it if it is clean enough at the end of all the rest. More importantly, a towel has massive psychological value. Anyone who can hitch the width and the length and the breadth of the galaxy, rough it, slum it, struggle against terrible odds, win through and still know where their towel is, is somebody to be reckoned with. We'll get back to the towel in just a moment. But first, though, a little story about passing the mantle. There's a long tradition in the Hebrew scriptures of leaders and prophets, kings and judges, and they equip the next generation that comes after them. They prepare the leaders of the next generation to move forward into new realities, new missions, into a new world as God helps them to discern the mission that they have for the world that surrounds them. And as those people face trials and tasks, one generation's leaders seek to equip the next with the ability to lead through that changing world, changing settings, changing of ideas of what it even means to live a faithful and fruitful life. Now, this long Hebrew tradition certainly carries itself forward into our New Testament stories. As we read story after story about Saul and Philip and Peter planting new and faithful communities, equipping the saints to lead them. One of my favorite scriptures, one of my favorite characters in the Hebrew scriptures is a man named Elijah. And he has this own story of equipping the next generation. Elijah is known as one of Israel's most fierce and passionate prophets. He takes on a violent queen and a ruthless king and he calls down drought and famine on his own land. And yet he's able to provide for a widow and her son. And when that son dies, he's even able to bring that son back to life. Elijah challenges not just the prophets of the competing gods. But he challenges the prophetesses. He challenges Baal and Asherah. He's a single person against hundreds of other prophets as they seek to establish strength and might on a contest on the top 
of a mountain. The same mountain that many things happen to in, in, in this Bible. And Elijah wins the challenge. And then he flees. And then Elijah meets God on another mountain. Another mountain in which many things happen where Moses met this same God. And as Elijah came to that encounter on the top of the mountain, he was feeling devastated. Even after all of the accomplishment, even after all of the success, he felt alone, he felt tired, he felt exhausted. And so God asks him to do something. God asks Elijah to take on people. As Elijah realizes that his time is coming to a close, he turns to this disciple that he has taken on, this man named Elisha, and he asks him to remain with him for one final long journey. And the two of them travel the land of Israel, eventually coming to the Jordan River. And as they step up to the bank, Elijah takes off his mantle, he takes off this prayer shawl, and he rolls it up, and he steps up to the Jordan River, and he begins to beat it. And as he does so, just like the Red Sea in front of Moses, and just like the Jordan River for Joshua, the river parts. And so he steps through, and Elisha follows him, and as they reach the other side of the, ba the uh, bank, Elijah turns to Elisha, and he says, Elisha, what can I do you? As I go, what is it that you want? And Elisha, who's also known for his passion, says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Suddenly, Elijah is wrapped up in a whirlwind and carried off to heaven, and the only thing that remains is a prayer shawl. Elisha, ready for the transition, perhaps was not ready for the suddenness of it. He grabs the shawl, he flees back to the riverbank, and in an act of depression and desperation and he again just starts to beat the river. And he screams out, God, where are you? Where is my rabbi gone? Where are you? And as he's beating the river, suddenly the waters part once again. And he's able to travel through back into the promised land. And Elisha, it seems in this moment, has found the spirit of his companion. The spirit of his companion is the very spirit of God, and it's enabled Elisha to do exactly what his rabbi had done. Now, this tradition is well known among Jesus' disciples. And you can imagine the anticipation at this supper. Jesus is continually predicted that this hour is approaching. And as the disciples enter Jerusalem to celebrate the liberation of the Passover, to pray and to hope for God's continued faithfulness, for God's continued deliverance, the one that they know as Lord and Savior, the one that they know as Rabbi, is about to depart. And I can imagine that as they recline at that supper, that maybe the story of Elijah and the story of Elisha might come to mind. That maybe those disciples turn to Jesus and they say, Jesus, let us have a double portion of your spirit. Let us do what you do. Give us the ability to be the people that you call us to be, to do the things that you do, Jesus. But rather than leaving his disciples with a mantle, Jesus instead leaves them with a towel. But not before he uses it. 
The master takes a position lower than even most of the slaves would have taken. And he cleans the legs and the feet of these disciples that have followed him for miles and miles and miles and years and years. And one by one by one by one by one by one by one, he cleans feet. He cleanses and he comforts the feet of these weary travelers, of those that would continue to walk even after he no longer would. He soothes and he equips the next generation. But this time, the task that the disciples have will not be a battle of fire and rain on the top of a mountain. This task it would appear is much more simple. But it may still be rather difficult. The task is to serve. It's to cleanse, it's to purify, it's to make holy, it's to love. Yes, this task is simple, but it's not easy. For even Judas must sit And receive the cleansing that this master gives him. Judas feels his rabbi gently and lovingly caress his feet. He feels the kneading of the soap on his skin as his vulnerable flesh is touched by his vulnerable Savior. As even he is prepared to walk where he must go. And Jesus watched each of those feet. Not just those that would betray him, but those that would flee as he's on the cross. And then somewhat like Elijah, Jesus is taken up in a whirlwind. But this is a whirlwind of violence. But he did leave something behind for these disciples to pick up even as he was taken. And it might be the most massively useful thing that a traveler of weary roads of life might have. He left behind the towel. And with the towel, he left a mandate. Love one another. I have loved you. So if you decide to pick up a towel, if you decide to begin to wash, if you begin to serve and to cleanse and to purify and to make holy all that you might encounter, if you especially make use of this towel when a pair of filthy feet from a person stained, from a person that has been unfaithful approaches you, if you can cleanse the one that is to betray you, if you can purify the one that abandons you, if you can see the holiness of the flesh, of the human hurt, if you can love even as we have been loved, you might begin to realize that the spirit of our very own companion is the very spirit of God and that that spirit resides now in you and that you have been given the power you have been given the authority to do exactly as our rabbi has done so friends fellow travelers disciples I hope for my sake I hope for your sake, I hope for the sake of our children and for the sake of this world that needs transformation, that you know where your towel is. In the name of the God who commands love from the beginning of the story, and the Son who loves and serves, and the Spirit who inspires each of us to take up a towel, amen.
Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. And this proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. My friends, let us pray. O loving God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and grape juice, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with, each, make us one with Christ and one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, as those who have received forgiveness and who are disciples, let us pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. My friends, in just a moment, I want to, I want to invite now all those who will assist them with Holy Communion to come forward. And as they make their way forward, I do want to say a word about this table, for this is not a uniquely United Methodist table. It is the table of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, and everyone who is here is invited. You are welcomed to come. As you do come, you're going to come at the direction of the ushers, and uh, we invite you to fill up from the sides to the front. Uh, First, you can stand or kneel as uh, you are able, Uh, and if for whatever reason you physically can't come forward, 
Uh, we'll bring Holy Communion to you where you sit. If you do need a gluten-free alternative, just let the servers know, and we will have that available for you as well. But my friends, this is an appropriate night to celebrate Holy Communion. The very gift of Christ Jesus himself to each of us. A gift that was given and continues to be given every time that we celebrate communion. The gift that we so desperately need that we may not even realize how much we need it. But God is with us and God walks with us tonight. And let's think about this. If we really are to love others, shouldn't we receive the love of Christ, the being of Christ into our being? So that we can be changed and transformed in that love. So that we can then take Holy Communion out to the world. My friends, will you come and will you keep the feast?
Join me now in our prayer after receiving. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My friends, I want to read to you from the Gospel of Mark, 14th chapter, verses 32 through 42. And as we allow the Word of God to settle upon us on this night, as we go forth from this place, I pray that you find yourself in this scripture reading. Who are you? And what is the Holy Spirit? saying to you this night. 
they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to distress, be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into a time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. My friends, as we leave here in this night, I do remind you that we leave in silence. I say that because it is so important for us on this holy night, as we have heard again the story of the amazing love that God has for us. A love that washes dirty feet. We need to think about it. Even if the silence is awkward, you know, maybe that's even better that way. Let's not put any pressure on ourselves, but let's go deep within. Because we are loved. And let's contemplate that love. But then let's ask this question. Where's your towel? You have been loved. You have had your feet washed. Whose feet is God calling you to wash? Go now. Go now in that love. Ready your hearts. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.